Hi, this is Alex Bryant um, uh, with East West, uh, President of East West Associates. I uh, wanted to thank you all for attending the event today, Mitigating Fraud and Corruption in China Operations. Um, what are the best corrective actions, how to address ongoing risk? Given the fact that we had this many people sign up today for this event, it's obviously a very relevant topic. Um, I'm going to kind of move through this process. We've got four very good speakers, four very knowledgeable speakers. Um, so I just want to hit on a couple things at the beginning. Here's our agenda. We're going to have an introduction of Grant Thornton, an introduction of East West, um, which will both be relatively brief. We're going to have a mitigating of fraud and corruption, why the topic is so relevant now, why are so many people signing up for this. We're going to review two case studies. That will take us a total of about 20 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to hit the Q&A session, and that Q&A session will last about 40 minutes. Um, and that's the uh, critical piece here. Uh, we want people asking questions. I've, I've gotten a ton of questions to come in today um, and earlier than today of questions people have. I've got down several here in the case and then we've got a bunch more that are. Um, if you want to ask a question, please go to the section here um, called questions and type in your question to me and I will get it into uh, ask, get it into the line to ask these uh, presenters. Um, so that's the main thing. Just go to the uh, question section down here and click it. Um, and we are taking questions all throughout the event. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask. You don't have to wait. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to get the introduction of Grant Thornton. So Tim, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Alex. And uh, greetings, everyone, um, so wherever in the world you are today. Uh, my name is Tim Clotty. I'm the, the head of Forensic Advisory Services for Grant Thornton in Shanghai. Um, I came out to China in 2006 with the intention to stay for two years, and that was 18 years ago. Uh, I've been enjoying it ever since and seen a lot of changes here. I lead the forensic business, and so you can imagine the, uh, the variances of compliance issues that we're facing. Um, our team is based in Shanghai, and we really focus on compliance-related matters and investigation support for mostly multinational companies in China. Warren? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, this is Warren Clark. I'm an audit partner and lead our national China business group. I'm currently based in Atlanta. Um, I, like Tim, have spent a lot of time in China. Um, I started my career in LA and then moved to Beijing in 1996. Um, was there for six years and then moved to Shanghai for six years. And then I've worked in Philadelphia and Detroit and then back to China starting in 2017 on a long-term assignment. And just last year, I returned to Atlanta. I primarily work with U.S. companies that um, have operations across Asia. And then I work with Chinese companies that are listed on the U.S. exchanges um, and, or that are going public here. Um, with that, let's move on to the next slide. So let me take a minute and quickly introduce uh, Grant Thornton China. Uh, we're a firm or a practice that's uh, more than 40 years in, in the making, and we have over 7,000 professionals with locations in 28 cities around the country. Um, we have uh, audit tax advisory support. Uh, as I said, my team is uh, centrally located in Shanghai. And if you can go to the next slide, um, you can have a general overview of the offerings that we provide. Um, Next slide. So forensic advisory services, if you were to describe it in a single word, it would be compliance. Uh, compliance takes on a lot, of, a lot of faces. And so we're looking at ABAC reviews, event monitoring for the pharmaceutical industries. We do an abundance of compliance training for companies here, especially now post COVID. Uh, we provide expert witness support. Uh, a large part of our business looks after whistleblower advisory. And then of course, fraud investigation work. Finally, integrity due diligence or background checks is a, is a continued uh, continues to be in demand. Uh, so these are the, the primary offerings in the market that we've helped multinational companies with over the years. I've been leading the team for about eight years now and have seen quite a lot in terms of forensic support requests. Next slide. Yeah, so that's a bit about uh, GT China. Uh, internationally, uh, Grant Thornton is, is a... Uh, is a large full service professional services network um, with a global presence. Um, 
many people are surprised to see that we do have operations in over 135 different countries and and such a large number of people and, and offices around the globe. Um, to the next slide, a little bit about the US firm. Um, if we can move to the next slide, there we go. Uh, the, our US firm is in our 100th year um, and we are headquartered in Chicago, but have operations all across the US. Um, and with, that's Grant Thornton. Let's move on to East West. All right. So I'll briefly introduce East West Associates. Um, say where we are. We're in these five regions. Um, we're operating the US, Mexico, Central Eastern Europe, China, and Southeast Asia. Our primary work has done has traditionally always been in China. That's where we were. And then gradually over the last few years, we've begun to expand outside of China into Southeast Asia such as Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines. We have people in all these different countries, all boots on the ground in China, Southeast Asia, Poland, and Central Eastern Europe, Mexico, and then the U.S. And uh, we kind of, we East West kind of tell you what we do. We are really an operations execution firm. Um, we get, uh, we are not the accountants, we're not the lawyers. We are a group of individuals who have uh, led Western companies on the ground, had p responsibilities and senior manager responsibilities for running Western companies on the ground in China, Southeast Asia, Mexico, Central Eastern Europe, Poland, and here in the U.S. And we do four services, primarily um, you've got global manufacturing and supply chain services, and primarily what that, that entails is because companies are diversifying beyond China, we are developing and implementing their global manufacturing footprint and the supply chain strategy so we get closer to China, right? That's really um, a core part of what we're doing. To do that, we have to close factories, consolidating factories, relocating, do a lot of global site selection work, negotiating uh, with foreign governments getting into Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico, um, and then we set up operations right as well so, and, um, and, and oversee the construction of that. That's kind of core one. Second core area is operational com and commercial performance, and that's really at existing operations. A lot of that is due diligence, M&A due diligence. Um, a lot of that is operational turnaround and restructuring for companies that are struggling in the market, process improvement, um, and um, we do some market research, uh, particularly in the countries where people are trying to get into in Southeast Asia. Third area, which is what we're covering today, human resource risk management, uh, executive search and general management, uh, background checks, uh, and then integrity awareness training and supply chain. We do all aspects of the supply chain, identifying, qualifying, transitioning, may versus buy. We do a lot of in, in, um, overt investigations of suppliers because notably um, someone's buying from three or four different suppliers and they find out that these three or four different suppliers are owned by the same family, right? That happens consistently. So those are four services, but executive search and interim general manager are what we're going to be talking about today. And then who the, that's kind of what we do and who the people that do it. Our executives obviously have had p responsibilities, lived on the ground in these different regions. Um, and so you can see where they've been, we've been, there have been different titles, but with Little Fuse, Briggs Stratton, Eastman Kodak, Aston Chemicals, and we've done it in a variety of different industries. So that is uh, all you need to know about East West. Um, I'm now going to turn over to Dan if you provide a background and then Alicia. Sure, thanks, Alex. Uh, Dan McLeod, I've been working with uh, East West for about six years now. Uh, prior to that, was in Asia for more than 20 years, uh, 13 of which at various points in my career we were in China. So starting in the late 90s, moved to Shanghai. Uh, yeah, another one of those people that went on a short-term assignment that turned into 20 plus years. Um, <laughs> originally went over to help design and oversee construction and hiring and staffing of a factory uh, in the chemical industry and, uh, and continued my career there through for operations management and also management of uh, large capital projects, uh, which would include overseeing the design and construction. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, the majority of that time in in China, but uh, uh, also uh, lived in lived and worked throughout Southeast Asia as well. Uh, Li Xiao. Li Xiao, you're on mute. 
Oh, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Thanks, Tom. Uh, my name is Li Xiao. I've been, um, I had 15 years experience on turnaround and transformation. Um, I, st I actually started my career with a US Fortune 500 company and then moved on with a management consultant. Uh, after that, uh, established a, a hydraulic cylinder factory in East China. Um, later on, um, I moved on to turnaround management. So re most recently, uh, I've been interim GM for uh, laundromat retail chains, as well as uh, electric motor business here in East China. Great, thank you, Li Xiao. Uh, so now we're gonna get into kind of the mitigating fraud and corruption. Why is this relevant? Um, I'm gonna turn this over now to uh, Tim, I'll let you take it away from here. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to kind of level set and give everyone an appreciation of kind of how fraud is perceived in the market. Uh, whether you're talking about China or other jurisdictions around the world, um, we've got this concept called the fraud triangle. It was developed in the 50s by a gentleman named Donald Cressy, who was one of the one of the keynote men in fraud uh, fighting and risk mitigation. Um, Donald Cressy basically developed this triangle with the points being you've got to have an opportunity. An opportunity could be defined as internal control weaknesses, um, ineffective monitoring of the controls. You have opportunities where in recent times you're seeing uh, individuals work from home, so they're on unsecured networks uh, during the COVID work from home policies. Um, another one would be the pressure that individuals have. That pressure could either be financial or work. It could be from in the financial side, they're living a lifestyle that they have to maintain. And so they have a kind of addiction to performing, overperforming to take unethical actions. Uh, the, the work pressures could be overlooking for promotions, not getting the pay increase they expected. And overall, they've got a pressure that is combined finally with the final leg of the triangle of rationalization. Rationalization is the concept that they deserve it or they will pay it back or the company's rich enough and they're not gonna miss a few hundred thousand or it's something that that's their own fault because the company's inefficient. And so they rationalize the, the use and the effectiveness of being unethical. And it's when you have all three of these elements present that you have fraud or at least the high uh, percentage of fraud being there. According to Cressy, he said, if you've got one element missing, for example, if you have an opportunity and pressure, but you fail to rationalize it, then you're not going to really have an opportunity or a serious uh, situation with fraud. So I put this slide here to give everyone an appreciation of kind of where we're starting. We're about to answer a lot of questions and go through some case studies. And I thought putting up the fraud triangle helps to kind of put this into per, you know, perspective in terms of you know, what we're looking at on the ground here in China when we're doing investigations and how we're evaluating where these activities are taking place. So if we can go on to the next slide. Sure. Yep. I'll take this one, Tim. Um, yeah, I'll take this one. The risk of fraud is always present when operating in business. And in my 30 plus year career, I have been associated with resigning from audits both in the US and in China as a result of fraud related matters. Um, so it's, as Tim mentioned, it's not specific to China, but given the current situation there, um, there, there is a higher perceived risk. You know, China has always been a very dynamic business environment. And that's why so many of us have enjoyed being part of that incredible story for the last few decades. Um, but China continues to evolve and now we talk in, in terms like State Department travel advisories, not investable, decouple and de-risk. And managing a China business um, after COVID and in a virtual environment is particularly challenging. And, and that's why we're here today. Um, Dan and Li Xiao, do you have Dan, any comments on, this comments on this topic for today? Yeah, I, I think, um, one thing to stress is this the situation around uh, fraud and corruption is not certainly not unique to uh, China and we've we've all worked in, in other parts of the world where uh, it's challenging as well but between the COVID restrictions 
and the uh, you know political situation, it's it's uh, it's become more noticeable in, in in China, more more high profile in China uh, these days. Um, and, it, and things have gone very much from a, 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 a companies from a move to investing in China to uh, more of a view of China as as managing the risk and companies uh, being uh, more sensitive to expansion and uh, and, and further investment. Um, one of the things that was uh, that we saw going through COVID is in the lack of you know contact with operations and and employees uh, between headquarters and and overseas operations was uh, in, in many cases those relationships and those uh, the operation uh, the performance of those operations frayed and um, want to share maybe some of our experiences today on that and and how you know talk a little bit about uh, how to mitigate uh, that and also uh, you know some best practices perhaps we talk about best practices on how companies successfully manage through uh, those strained times and, and came out the other side, as well as talk about some that did not do so well, you know, through certainly share some insights that we gained through their experience in, in the case studies. Um, Lishao, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, um, something unique or, or special about Chinese culture may, may add some more light is um, uh, we tend to be more reserved when we have a conflict or when we have something uh, we're not certain about, especially uh, we, when we respect hierarchies. Um, the senior manager uh, is is making some request on something sp suspicious, but not illegal. Uh, then the employee tend to actually follow without uh, a strong um, um, disagreement. So in that case, a uh, strong and, and uh, refreshing whistleblowing program would be helpful. And then uh, uh, keep reviewing that with the whole team will be very important. That's a good point. Very good point. Um, uh, thank you, Li Xiao. Uh, why don't we then uh, take a turn and look at the case studies. We've got two case studies. Um, and then we're going to dive into Q&A uh, session. Um, I did have, uh, we've already got a question that has shown up um, thus far. The um, question was, um, it came from um, one of the people uh, that is registered. Again, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to go ahead and mark it down in the question section, send it to us so we can ask it. Um, this question uh, starts off with um, about re when you're looking to get employees, when you're looking to hire somebody, how do you, what are there certain characteristics or steps you should take to make sure that they're, they're see if there are red flags involved? Or are there certain things you should be looking for in an employee that, that is uh, going to help make you feel comfortable that you're getting the right employee? Um, and I'll open that up to all of you. Um, Lee Xiao or uh, uh, Tim, you want to start off with those? Yeah, I, I can jump in and, and answer something on this point. Um, definitely, when you're looking at employees to see if there are any flashing issues uh, at the initial stage of the interview or before they accept a position, um, you know, keep in mind if they're if they're hopping around and ask them why, you know, ask the questions about why you're moving from job to job, and if if it's something related to moving industries, uh, going out of an industry and coming back into the industry. Uh, there could be something there or any sudden lifestyle changes where they took some time off or they took an extended trip or vacation um, that really didn't warrant what their previous salary justified. Um, look at relationships as well. Uh, we'll talk later about conflicts of interest as this being one of the major issues that we face today in China doing uh, corporate investigations. Make sure that those connections, um, you know, ask the hard questions at the interview process. Uh, that's that's kind of my initial reaction at this point, but uh, and we'll get into more details later. But Li Xiao, did you have any initial comments? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, some other red flags could be when we do the reference checks. Um, if we talk only to peers or subordinates, usually we'll get positive comments. 
but if we have uh, uh, some talks or conversations with our um, managers, we usually may get some other uh, side stories about this specific candidate. Um, it may raise, ring the, uh, raise some red flags, such as um, this person may have strange reimbursement sometimes, or they travel uh, without uh, uh, certain guidelines, this kind of uh, um, uh, message is coming out, which can be a red flag as well. And Dan? Great. Yeah. I was going to say, and I think okay. Tim touched on this briefly, is the <clears throat> going beyond, I guess, sort of a typical reference check to, to lifestyle, looking at lifestyle, um, We, but it's also uh, possible to look at you know, relationships with company, company ownerships and investments. Uh, that information is uh, is often uh, helpful to ass assess someone's uh, situation, personal situation that may be problematic, and also monitoring a social media. Um, you you get a you get a good sense of uh, someone's lifestyle and their priorities through social media, and perhaps uh, look for some things that may raise flags there. Something that wasn't necessarily av available ten years ago, but with the with the prevalence of WeChat and, and social media in general in China, it's uh, it's a valuable source of information to, to check someone's background. All right. Um, in, uh, why don't we at this point turn to the case studies and um, uh, thank you for that question. And we'll now turn to the case studies. Uh, Dan, why don't you take this first page if you would? Sure. Uh, first case study is a, uh, a company we worked with not too long ago, it's, it's a Midwestern manufacturing company that have operations in China, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, Malaysia. Uh, they're in the business of manufacturing and distributing electronic sensors um, in, in primarily into the automotive and some healthcare and industrial sectors as well. Um, the factory and, and distribution center, main one in China is located in East China, south of South Shanghai. Um, and their primary markets were uh, within China, although they did do some export business, uh, but primarily in China from that operation to uh, predominantly Western companies and uh, had, had begun to develop uh, local domestic companies as well. Uh, it was established uh, through a trading company in 2001 um, in the China operation again in 2013 uh, some way, but still uh, more than 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Uh, the leadership at, uh, at the company, senior management at the company, including the general manager, have been involved since essentially the beginning with the, with the GM, um, had hired uh, most of that senior staff and you know, set up the company, put it in place, put the systems in place. Uh, the company did have a formal uh, whistleblower program uh, in place to report wrongdoing or employee concerns about business practices uh, and so that had been that was well established and they received uh, uh, several complaints uh, from uh, on this hotline about corruption uh, through this op in the China operation uh, they included you know, kickbacks uh, to suppliers and customers uh, falsifying of travel expenses uh, and invoices and uh, siphoning off profit through and one of the ways in uh, setup of companies uh, by the managers to act as agents and go-betweens and between the uh, the client and and the and the final customer, and and we're you know taking significant agency fees associated with that. So that was the background on on this one. Next slide. Yeah. All right. Uh, why don't we then now turn over to uh, see corrective actions. Uh, Tim, you want to take that? Yep, sure. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we identified uh, through through the whistleblowers' allegations that a lot of the information was indeed true. Um, but it's important to verify and have a follow-up opportunity to sit down or at least talk with the whistleblower before the investigation begins. Uh, so when the client hired us, uh, we went ahead and arranged to have a conversation with the individual. And I personally sat down for four hours and spoke to and debriefed the whistleblower in the Grant Thornton office. Uh, we were able to get new information, verify old information, and confirm 
that this was something that has been, uh, you know, not not been addressed for years. Uh, so what we did was we took a holistic approach and we looked at not just um, the accounting vouchers and their contracts to verify the information that was alleged by the whistleblower, uh, but we also conducted interviews to understand the processes and policies of the organization to verify uh, what was indeed said. Uh, from there, we were identify we were able to identify the specific targets in the investigation and through technology support. We imaged the computers, looked at communications to verify indeed there was conflicts of interest between third parties outside of the organization and the uh, employees. And then we combined all of that uh, with what we call the corporate intelligence or the background checks. And we were able to you know, look at conflicts of interest again and really kind of appreciate how severe this issue was. So uh, one takeaway from this slide that you know I want to impress on everyone is that when you're conducting an investigation, it's critical to really look at this 360 degrees. So that can be accomplished through interviews, uh, through accounting voucher reviews, sample selection, also through the technology imaging and review of computer uh, communications. And then the, as said earlier, uh, social media, public records, background check work. So from all of this approach that we did, which we would call the investigation, uh, we were able to confirm that a lot of the allegations were indeed true, and we were able to identify which employees were involved in what allegations and how much of a financial and also reputational impact it had on the organization. So the result is we terminated six employees. Um, the terminations were quite direct and clear because the evidence was equally direct and clear. And so when they shared the evidence, our findings with them, uh, there was really nothing that they could say or argue because they were indeed smoking guns. And so with the six employees that were terminated, that included the general manager, the HR director, the CFO, and others that were facing the market, such as in sales. And so that's the uh, GT approach that we took. Um, it's, it's really good to, again, take away the holistic approach that's critical. And I'll uh, turn it over to Lee Xiao to kind of finish off this case. Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks for the contacts. With, uh, with all the contacts, actually the client um, hired us uh, to install Intern GM, which is myself, plus um, the human resource director, one of our colleagues, uh, and also um, the client engaged Gwen Thornton to have the interim CFO along with us. So with that, um, or three, three new um, senior manager with the very first day when we came to the uh, facility uh, our first thing is to to take over the business license as well as the company shop as everyone is aware uh, these uh, documentations and and the company shop is, is is having very high importance very high importance which um, um, can somehow um, define what the, uh, the company liabilities and and and, and so on so that the very first day we grabbed that uh, in control. Um, besides um, the US management team and, and uh, the three of us um, joined the town hall of the whole, uh, with the whole team, announcing what has happened, uh, why we are there, what will be the next steps. So given that the employees have some, some sort of degree uh, of uncertainty, because all six top managers are, are, are fired. Uh, um, there will be certainly some gap to fill. And with that, we spend a huge amount of time talking to the team leaders, um, going to uh, the facility, understand what, what the potential gap will be. And, um, and another thing is uh, we, we spend very much time with the US side as well. Um, so the US management team can also understand what's happening. So on, on a weekly basis, we'll have uh, team discussions and, and also feedbacks on, and, and, and um, um, going through some ideas on how to quickly get three of us on board in the meantime to, uh, to calm down the team and to maintain the stability of the business. Another uh, important factor or, or, uh, is on the uh, stakeholder side. We also announced uh, messages to our uh, 
customers as well as the supply chain, making sure they understand um, we had an organization change. We also had a new team leaders to take the ownership so that uh, uh, both customers and supply chain understand we are going through this change. Uh, in the meantime, they have uh, uh, people uh, accountable to, to discuss about uh, actions and also uh, fulfill orders, et cetera. And another critical thing we, we find um, very, very helpful is um, uh, with Grant Thornton having the uh, investigation, we kind of have some, having some idea which employees are trustworthy, who are uh, giving us um, insights and, 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 and telling us the true stories. So with that as a base, we spend really a lot of time um, trying to understand who are really professional uh, managers and who are on the ground supporting the business. And so that uh, uh, give us a, a, a good picture of who we should definitely retain uh, and, and someone we feel suspicious and we, we we don't really think they are adding value, we'll actually put them on the list to be further uh, investigated. So uh, with that um, um, in mind, we um, further look at the SOPs, um, try to understand if the management team here and uh, understand what the US is or headquarters is designed, sometimes we find there's a huge gap because uh, obviously the previous management team is creating this gap or, uh, or um, um, mistakes to, to, to leverage that to, for their own benefits. So this is with, uh, um, so during the process, we go through that with the employees and we actually got huge uh, appreciation from the uh, local team here because they never had that. Um, they find this is really helpful to understand what's really behind and what the uh, US or the headquarter is, is the, the direction will be. So um, we we'll also give a, a very positive message to the team to say, um, the U.S. Um, management team is very committed to China, and this is not uh, a risk for for uh, the whole company because we're trying to get through this um, difficult time, and we'll remain competitive. We'll, we'll keep uh, uh, growing together together with the team here in in, in Asia. Um, when when the whole business gets stabilized. Um, the client engaged us further to search for a permanent GM. Um, and naturally, uh, because I had all the background, I understand what the responsibilities and what the qualities would require for this position. So we quickly identified a, a permanent candidate and the transition was much more easier um, than a normal um, hire. Great, thank you. So Lee that's Shell. the case. Yep. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, very helpful. We'll now turn to the next. Um, uh, excuse me. Now turn to the next uh, case study, um, and I think Tim, you're going to tackle that one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, this case study, I'll, I'll spend about five minutes on because I want you to appreciate um, that we always got to take this concept of trust but verify. Um, this investigation was a little bit unique in a sense that many times we'll do investigations where those who are being investigated are the sales or the procurement or those facing the market outside like HR or even finance. In this particular case, um, this was the management team. And so we were called in by three whistleblowers. So individual allegations, total of three came in and said the management team's abusing their position they are taking money on the side 
they're keeping funds that should go to the company and et cetera. And so we had a very serious matter on our hands because this would have changed and did in fact change the entire direction of the company's culture because the result was the removal of the management team. Uh, so quickly, let me go through this slide to kind of share with you the key points. Um, the allegations were three. Uh, the first one was they were taking their tax refunds because of the amount of tax they paid in the district that they were in. They were able to get uh, discounts or refunds back uh, given the volume that they paid, and they were putting it in their pocket instead of bringing it back to the company. Second, they were taking compensation bonuses that were outside of the company's structure in their contract in the total of about a million US each. And they were putting that in their pocket and justifying it by saying it was part of their structure when in fact it was not written into their contract whatsoever. Next, they were abusing documents and they were using false receipts and certifications from vendors to maintain improper relationships. And so we had, uh, in, in this particular industry, they were the, the certifications are critical and they were using and leveraging fake certifications to get uh, specific vendors then they could command prices and take more kickbacks. Um, they were using, un, un, um, we could say, unethical or unauthorized uh, service agreements as well. And so they were using documentation for their financial advantage as well. The third allegation that came through when these, when these three whistleblowers raised their hand was that the policy violations. And so they were basically monitoring the employees um, through a way that they didn't need to do. So they had a a personal vendetta or they had a personal view on an employee, they would ask IT or tell IT, say, get me his or her computers. I want to see what their communications look like. And so they were doing this without cause. It was just more of a personal bias. And they were monitoring the travel expense or the, the, time, the travel expense policies as well. But they weren't uh, following the rules themselves. They were uh, behaving above the law in that sense. And so, again, as I mentioned in the first case, one of the critical things you do in an investigation is you sit down right away and talk to the whistleblowers. And if you can, once you've flushed, uh, flushed that out, you have a talk with those who are, uh, who's, who, who are being alleged to do this. So I had the opportunity to sit down in the GM's office and I had a two, a, two and a half hour conversation with, with one of them and the management team. And when I looked around his office, his office was beautifully decorated with ethics awards with compliance awards. He was taking you know, the highest of ethical standards and he was pushing policies when in fact he was the one that was crossing the line on the ethics violations his whole time with the organization. And so again, I go back to this concept of when you're doing interviews, when you're conducting investigations, you've got to trust them, but you've got to verify as well. So with the interviews, we took the management team one by one and talked to them. We also understood the internal controls and policies by speaking with HR, IT, finance, uh, sales, and those different divisions. And then from that, we had a better appreciation of the company's organization and their approach to the business. Then we looked at documents. We took sample selections and we focused on the suspicious areas where the allegations were there. And then we were able to image the computers of the management team and look at their communications and see where they did specifically order the IT department to look at people's emails and look at people's communications without just cause. And so that was actionable evidence that we were able to obtain through a technology approach. Eight allegations were raised in total. We were able to substantiate six of them. We have evidence or we had evidence to prove that they did and indeed put the money in their pocket that was used for, uh, supposed to be given back to the company for their tax rebates. Uh, we confirmed fake certifications by calling uh, the certifying body and we talked about them, talked with them about that. They confirmed that it was fake and seven of the certifications pointed to the same vendor, which you know, indicated another improper relationship and also probably an abuse of power. If you wanna work with us, you've gotta pay, and that type of mentality. And then we also found that the IT manager, going back to what Lee Xiao said, is that sometimes it's beyond culture. Sometimes individuals will just follow orders because that's what their management told them to do rather than have the individual uh, sense to speak up and say something. But unfortunately, in this case, the IT manager uh, just followed the orders and had disregard of the company's interests and put them second to the management's orders. And so he was pushing communications of employees around the office, which he shouldn't have done. From there, we really talked about, you know, what needs to be done. 
uh, frankly speaking, some companies will not terminate because they don't want to lose the revenue stream. In this case, this company was very high on ethics at the headquarters level, and they said the management team's got to go. And so we did the terminations of the individuals at the management team, and we put a new team in place. We established a compliance committee uh, from the headquarters level, and we enhanced the training on compliance. In the Q&A session, we'll talk more about training and why it's important, and we enhanced the frequency. Third and last, we increase communications. We feel that whenever you've got a whistleblower channel out there, it's useless if it's not being activated and leveraged. And so we really push this concept about whistleblowing and how it's the right of the employees and everybody that's connected to the company, including the suppliers and the vendors, that if they see something, they've got to say something. And so we really push the concept and the culture of whistleblowing uh, activity in terms of being, making sure that's their empowerment to do that. And so that's been a very helpful thing in terms of helping the companies feel more empowered to push the ethics and compliance. And so while the case study had a very series of stressful moments as I was in the, in the trenches there for many weeks uh, working with this, I can tell you that at the end, the company's a lot better off today. Um, they, they took a hit in the beginning, but now they're, they're in much better position and the culture of the company is right back on track because they made a decision to take the high road, separate from the current from the management team at that moment, and go for more of an ethical approach. And so this is a, start, a story that started out rough, but it actually had a better ending uh, than we expected because now it's in a really good position. All right. Um, well, that's a perfect lead in then into our next section after covering those two case studies to an end to the Q&A topics. Here are some of the questions that we've already gotten uh, that have already popped up, and I've got a number of questions that you all have already sent in. Again, if you have further questions, uh, we may not get to everybody's questions, but please go to your, um, please go and, and click on questions, and you're welcome then to ask questions. Once you click onto your um, profile, uh, you'll see questions, dial in the questions and to us and we'll get into the pipeline. If we're not able to get to all your questions today, we will follow up with you on those questions. Uh, so the first question I got is around um, around here, around um, Warren, I think this is to you and to Dan really, but about, about some of the current risks of traveling to China and how China is now different uh, post COVID. Um, that's kind of just kicking off question number one, which we've been asked um, by the registrants. Maybe I'll start there. Um, I recently returned from China um, about earlier this month and was there for several weeks and traveling to multiple cities. Um, visas that were valid before COVID and that are still valid can be used. Um, there's no quarantine required. Um, you know, many of us were stuck in the 14 plus 7 quarantine experience, um, but those days are over. Uh, so on the face of it, everything seems to have returned to normal. Um, all of the delivery services um, for food and other things are all available, and um, you know there might be limited flights. Um, there are certainly not as many flights as there were before COVID, and travel is certainly more expensive. Um, but it is um, it is available, and you might have to stop in in multiple places rather than having a direct flight. But but it is it, it, the country is open, and and you're able to go. Um, I, I say that's on the face of it. Um, underlying are the risks of traveling there and um, the need to be careful with your communications devices, your computers. I'm using VPN um, if you can. So um, most of the VPN seems to be restricted. At least the VPNs that I had on my phone were not um, were not active. We're not we're not working. I couldn't use them. Um, but if you get some more, um, like my work VPN was was working fine. So there are some, um, there's still restrictions on internet access. Um, be careful as you talk to people, what you say, there, it is a very political charged environment. And as long as you're focused on business, um, in my view, you're probably in good shape. That's a very good point. Dan Lee Shao, would you add anything to that? I was, I was gonna say generally, uh, I've had similar experience I've been back a few times since the since COVID and the restrictions that it, um, and uh, it, it, no overt hostility through immigration, nothing like that. I have talked to 
a few uh, people that mentioned that they did get more questions on their itinerary and their plans for uh, being in China and the purpose for their visit than they had in the past, but nothing overly hostile. Uh, yes, Warren, good comment on VPN and access to uh, software and websites. Uh, I noticed after being away for you know, four, better part of four years, much more difficulty being able to access uh, websites, email, and uh, I had difficulties with VPN. I, it was hit or miss whether I could use it, and I used try two different ones. So that's something to be aware of. Um, this, in the in the period of time for three or four years, I did notice that the surveillance infrastructure is increased and that uh, you know this is street cams traffic cams and a genuine a generally uh, uh, people being concerned about uh, their communications whether it's electronic or just verbal communications so it's a uh, nothing openly hostile but uh, you can you can sense a bit of a change Perfect. Good. Um, next question will be uh, here on number um, Six question that pop that's come forward. We had a few people ask us that so on this page of summer six. The several clients have talked about or companies, prospects have talked about they've got a real rainmaker in China that's working for them, making them quite a bit of money, but they do have uh they do have some concern about his integrity. They, they don't think hard and fast, but they've got some true concerns about it. Um, and they're asking us about how we should handle it. Obviously, they want to keep generating the income, but there's that comes at a cost. Um, so uh, Tim, Warren, Lee Sheldon, what have you, Tim, why don't you tackle that and we shall provide your comments? Absolutely, thank Absolutely. you, Alex. Thank you. Um, I, I've seen a lot of examples where companies have taken the high road and taken the financial hit in the beginning to take a more sustainable approach in the end. But I have had companies come to me and say, we can't, take changes we can't take a hit because the direction's too good right now um and then what i have witnessed when those uh ceos from the companies say that about their china operations they don't have a sustainable strategy um, the rainmaker is not loyal uh the rainmaker will move if they he or she has a better opportunity and so it's just kind of you know using each other for a short term that doesn't have sustainable leverage for the company's business or reputation. Now, what should you do if you've got integrity questions or concerns about that individual? Uh, you know, if you've got an opportunity to shift some of their roles or responsibilities away to kind of see if that impacts the company's direction. Typically, these rainmakers are in that position because of their long-lasting and trusted relationships, mostly unethical relationships with their third parties and vendors and suppliers. Roll them off into a different uh, area. Make sure that you know you you're saying this as a kind of a way to promote the ethical culture of the organization. So a rotation base. Um, I I do recognize having been around China for over 30 years. I can say that. Yes, relationships are what drives the culture here. However, business is business, and this is how you've got to take the high road. And so my short answer to this is, you know, go back, talk to them, and if you see improper, have concerns about improper relationships, think about a rotating approach to get them off the account or, and then see where that goes from there. See how they react, at least at first instance, when you mention that. Alicia, do you have any follow-up? Yeah, I totally echo uh, what Tim is ex explaining. Um, but add, add to that something which I find maybe uh, uh, um, interesting is um, absolutely this um, the individual may give certain benefits at the beginning or for short term. But I, I would totally encourage the company to think about long term. If this guy or this person is um, um, as a GM or a leader, we cannot imagine what kind of team he or she may put together, right? Uh, what, what kind of uh, impact would that give back to the headquarters or to the U.S. and to the stakeholders like suppliers or, or customers? So this is all out of control. So even though in the short term, this person will help the uh, top line revenue, 
um, but it may actually impact the whole uh, chemistry of the of the whole team. More. Um, Warren, let me come back to you. Uh, one of the questions that popped up here was a company they've got, looks like they've got a China manufacturing plant, they got a subsidiary there. They asked, um, they get, as everybody knows, statutory audit every year. And um, they're asking about, can they rely on that audit to, as a way to detect fraud? So maybe we'll get Warren and Dan, any comments on that? Excuse me, I've seen many U.S. companies that rely on a local accounting firm to do their statutory audit because it's relatively cheap and yeah. they don't have any problems. No no problems are identified because of the audit. And in many cases, the reason for those, the reason it's not expensive and the reason that no problems are identified is because the work is not done properly. And so you, if, if you have a, if you're comfortable that you have a robust internal controls environment and that you have other means of getting good information about the your subsidiary there then maybe you feel comfortable with just going through that perfunctory process if however you are concerned about the operations there um, you certainly should be interested in having a robust audit completed every year the one concern though is that that is an annual process and the reporting is not due depending on the location the reporting and completion of that audit might not be until April or May of the following year. And so if something happened in January of this year, you're not going to you might not find out about it through the audit until April or May of next year. Um, and so there is certainly a delay there. So having those internal processes are continue to be important and having a robust audit certainly would help to um, to encourage management and know that somebody's going to be looking at what they're doing and that helps to uh, to avoid some of these issues that we're discussing today. Yeah. Um, that's a good good point. Um, that kind of brings up the idea then you talk about having the rope having a robust process done with the right people. Um, a question popped up here about corporate culture, really about how is the best way to embed corp a good corporate culture in a China subsidiary? Um, maybe Dan, you could tackle that and then um, and then Tim. Sure. Um it's a it's a pretty broad topic, but um, you know we we talk a little bit about I mean the, the concept of relationships in business uh, it came up earlier, and one of the things that we've seen uh, successful multinational companies um, go through uh, make the effort to develop and maintain relationships with the uh, the management team in China, in the relationship between the management team in China and, and their functional leads in, in headquarters. Um, and having, uh, and, and to, to make the extra effort to do that, particularly when there's a change in management and to have a, a structured process around training and development that includes both training in China, but also one that um, uh, where the employees would perhaps go to the U.S. if it's a U.S. based company, go to the U.S. or other other locations for training and development and, and networking with with their overseas colleagues. Um, this uh, pays dividends in, over the long term, and it's an area where we uh, we we could see a significant difference in companies uh, that came out of COVID. Those that had those strong relationships and stable relationships going into COVID, they were able to maintain operations and then generally high level of control and, and confidence at the end of it. Uh, saw a number of companies that had significant changes either, we'll just say before COVID or during COVID in the management teams. And they were the ones that tended to struggle more um, coming out of it in, in their business performance and, and concerns about the direction of the company taken in China. So it's a long-term process. Uh, but one that you know, companies that are successful dem demonstrate an ongoing commitment to developing both the skills and the relationships uh, with people on, on both in China and in and, and headquarters. Yeah, I, I would also like to add that uh, certainly the integrated approach is critical, uh, making sure that compliance does have a seat at the board when you're talking about strategic decisions in the organization 
making sure that the individuals understand that there is a kind of zero tolerance when it comes to compliance and infringements. Um, and then also the training element, you can never overtrain. Now that we're right. out of COVID, we, we have opportunities to go back to in-person training in the local language and sometimes even in the local dialect, uh, make the training as local as possible. It goes with things such as making sure your whistleblower program is in the local language as well. Uh, you can't expect mm -hmm. uh, employees to feel empowered when they're calling a 800 hotline back to the U.S. and expected to speak in English when they're trying to raise something that they've seen. Put the local whistleblower strategy in China as well. And so certainly with a lot of, we won't talk on this now, but the cross-border data flow uh, regulations and restrictions that also moves into activities such as whistleblower hotlines. And so localize it, but also keep in mind that there's an integrated approach with your headquarters so that they understand where the line is drawn when it comes to ethics, compliance, and risk management for the headquarters. Uh, good point. Lee Xiao, Warren, anything you would like to add to that? Oh, all right. The, uh, the a question popped up here which said, um, it said, what are the main pitfalls when the when a fraud issue is not properly dealt with? Um, Lee Xiao and, and Warren, why don't you all answer that if you would? Yeah, um, there actually we, we have seen many um, pitfalls actually happened if if it's not properly treated, especially on the compliance side, which can actually lead to legal risks. Uh, not just to a local level, may also actually affect uh, 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 the headquarters as well. So, um, and and that also can um, um, move on with uh, the customers and suppliers relationships. So, if we if we haven't dealt that in a proper way, um, the clients, the customers suppliers even employees may lose confidence and lose uh, uh, trust on, on on the company um, and uh, the other the other sensitive t uh, issue was on IPS um, we also find um, the fraud and, and and corruption may lead to the IP uh, conflict um, as well and Tim a Warren, either one? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Warren. Uh, Tim, you want yeah, to I, I would just think. Oh, oh, thank you, Warren. Go ahead, please. Warren? Maybe go to the next question. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Um, the, the next question popped up was here. Um, we're talking about um, in China, and the question popped up was around if you um, you've got a problem in China, like these two case studies talked about. Um, the, the, this client, um, they they've talked about they've got uh, they've got operations in China. Um, but they also got operations elsewhere in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, specifically. And they're wondering uh, if they're dealing to like we saw in the two cases, they got problems. Are those? How do you work to prevent those problems stay in China? Is really their question. So that it doesn't spread to. Is it limited to China, or how do you keep it from spreading to your other employees in Thailand or Vietnam or other parts of the world? If you've got fraud, corruption included, embedded in the, in the China operation. Alex, I can go ahead and jump in and then maybe we can ask Please. Dan or we can follow up. Um, in, in this in this particular part, um, we can clearly understand that they've got, we're assuming the allegations coming in through a whistleblower. I always emphasize uh, to, to the clients that you need to respond to the whistleblower with uh, some type of communications to affirm that you've received it, received it, received it take it seriously, and you're moving forward with the investigation work. 
uh, the inaction of such a of such a request is an action in itself in the sense that the other employees of the organization will see that nothing's being done and that will give them a green light to feel that they can conduct unethical behavior and continue it as well without any uh, uh, company's oversight. And so you, you get to the root of the problem, find the root cause, conduct a root cause analysis in the beginning of the investigation. If it's going beyond jurisdictions outside of China, making sure that you've got the right people in place and the right team to address it. And so uh, keep it as confidential as possible, but understand that do a root cause analysis and interview the whistleblower or get back to the whistleblower as quick as possible to find the, the spread of the allegation. Yeah, it is a cancer. Um, Jennifer so, from Kathy Lord. Uh, so right now you've got, uh, it is 12 o'clock. We've still got some questions to pop forward. So. We understand that the webinar itself is over, is over okay. after one hour, but please feel free to go ahead and um, if you want to listen to many questions, please feel free to stay on. Um, but thank Second you for attending the event. Audit team perform audits at those local entities or if they have local internal audit team, question mark. Uh, Christian, say that again, please. Uh, we had a question pop up. Um, all right, Lee, Lee Shad, would you like to have follow up on his questions around the idea of what happens if the if there the, the investigation is carried on and you you're trying to prevent it from spreading beyond China? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, to prevent it from um, um, happening outside China, right? Is that the yeah. question? Yes. Um, I guess um, the the thing is, um, we need to like like um, uh, Tim mentioned, we need to find out what the root cause is, uh, and if, if it's really happening only within China, um, we should tell it uh, uh, more uh, in a very confidential way. Uh, but it does if it does have, let's say IP related issue or. Uh, some other relevant issue may, may spread to 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 outside China. We should define some kind of a backup plan and also plan B to uh, to see what what kind of scenario would would uh, would would be in front of us, and uh, we may involve other global team to to have a certain action plan um, to stop that from happening. Yeah, because it's it is a, a cancer, um, and then mm -hmm. fair, fair one. and then the fraud can happen in China, it can happen in Southeast Asia, it can happen in the U.S. It's sort of not solely dependent on China. Uh, we just had a question pop in. This is from an uh, individual uh, with a larger multinational. Question was: Is does the headquarters, the U.S. headquarters, internal audit team, should they be coming over and performing the audits with the China team, or should they be relying? On, on the local internal audit. In other words, how often should the headquarters internal auditors be coming over there? Should they be leading in China or being a part of it? Uh, Warren and Tim, I think that's really up your area. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I think that's going to be very company specific. Um, obviously, having people having people from the head office on the ground would be helpful. Um, however, if that's not possible, having your local internal audit under working under the direction of the group audit um, the, or the headquarters internal audit group would be would be, you know, if that's as good as you can do, then that's what you can do. You can also engage a third party to help with any internal audit work that needs to be done and, and, and emphasize to local management and to the local employees that um, the head office is still concerned about how things are operating there. Okay, Warren, they were uh, the follow up question was that they, they would say that they, they had found it's better to have their team on the ground in China along with a, uh, another audit firm or getting them bringing over a bunch of Westerners who, who may not really appreciate China. They were trying to find is there a blend there or um, they, they just want to make sure that that the local audit team seems they know China. Then that's the one they've been relying on. Would, would you agree with that?
in general, I would agree with that. that. However, having if you want to embed the culture from the from the company, from the headquarters or from the group, go there. And if they don't understand China, maybe they can learn more about it and get more familiar with it and build relationships that they can leverage to work together going forward. But I wouldn't want to completely bifurcate the, the local operations from the headquarters and say that they operate independently. Um, there should be collaboration. You read that. Uh, Tim, anything you would add to that? No, I think he's he's answered it well. There's no no other for things to add from right. my side. You've answered that person's question well. Um, look at another uh, few more questions popped up. One was around what trends do you see in China in relation to in the compli corporate compliance? And in, in other words, do you all see the people on this phone call see a trend of having um, continued issues in this post-COVID world of 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 continued trends in in China as far as increased fraud and corruption, or what type of trends do you see in in the compliance space? Yeah, certainly uh, there are some trends that are popping up post COVID now here in China. Um, we're seeing, I mean, it goes without saying, an increased leverage on technology. Um, I've always told my team if you want to catch the fraudster, you have to think like the fraudster. And this means put yourself in the position of him or her to identify how we can take or they can take advantage of the organization. So the traditional methods of improper relations, kickbacks, and bribes are still very present. Um, but now we've got restrictions with, uh, you know, data privacy laws are being updated here. And as a result, we can't really look at the individual's phones without their consent. And a lot of business is now done on the phones. And so that's a big uh, challenge for us as uh, corporate investigators for this type of work. Um, certainly, the other issue would be um, now that there are no travel restrictions, we're, we're welcoming headquarters back into China post COVID. And it's really wonderful to see everybody come back into China. But I see that it's kind of like now there were a three year lockdown, the, the companies and subsidiaries were kind of running their business independently. We saw a lot of cases where that took place. And now that they had the announcement that headquarters was coming, they would put on a, a nice stage and, and really make everything look pretty. And then once headquarters left, it would be back to the situation. So I think there's a takeaway here to have really on the ground experts to understand the business, understand the environment, and really have a trusted uh, you know, go-to team to work to make sure that the subsidiaries in China are aligned with headquarters expectations and strategies. Um, that's something that needs to be implemented, implemented simply because uh, we're in a different environment now with COVID. Uh, behind us. And anything from Warren or others? Nope, that's good for me. No. Okay. Uh, one final question was, uh, there's two people on the, uh, have asked in this question here around, they um, are looking at purchasing a company, making an acquisition, um, and they, the, the two acquisition um, have subsidiaries in China. Is this part of a normal due diligence? And look, how do they uncover this during the due diligence process? Because this is, you know, the, the, this is this is obviously a risk. How do they uncover it during their due diligence? Is there a pro? Is that possible? Maybe Dan or Lee Shaw for that one. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things. Um, that we've seen be involved in due diligence is uh, what we we would approach it. East West would approach it from the I guess the non uh, auditing function, but more around organizational assessment. We like to spend time at a site um, talking with people, understanding the organization, understanding the personalities, and and get a sense of the corporate culture, and uh, being able to talk to people and get and, and get some understanding as, as part of that due diligence beyond uh, beyond just looking at the uh, the audit and accounting. Uh, we think that's an important part of the due diligence as well. Uh, good. good point, Doug. Alicia or um, Tim Warren, anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, along the uh, due diligence, mostly on the financial side, 
who spend a lot of time with uh, with the team over there, um, and we 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 can find interesting about their personality and how they treat colleagues, how they treat uh, partners. So those kind of soft skills may also add to uh, red flags or or if they're actually adding value. So um, other than a normal due diligence, spending time with uh, on the ground staff, as well as uh, 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 experience their company culture would definitely be helpful. Yeah, um, I agree with that. That's critical in the due diligence. Our uh, last question we have uh, came in. Um, it says, what is, with the continued use of WeChat in the business environment, um, how can I have confidence I've got a compliance program in, about my compliance program in China? The manufacturer um, that has a compliance program, but they're concerned about use of WeChat business environment, how are you gonna be able to follow along and have confidence in your compliance program? That's a, a Tim or a Warren call. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first jump on this one. I think um, this is a real issue that organizations are facing here in China. As I mentioned earlier, there's challenges with data privacy in sense that you can't just uh, look at the individual's phone because that crosses the line there. So legally that's not allowed without their consent. Um, WeChat is where business takes place nowadays, uh, trans uh, communications. You've even seen the you know contracts being moved over through WeChat attachments. And so it's a real challenge, it's a headache. And I, I see this in every investigation that I conduct. But one thing I've seen also as a best practice that companies are putting WeChat into the forefront of their compliance programs by having a communications platform. I've even seen some companies use WeChat as a way to, uh, and they've got secure ways to do it, is to leverage that as a way for whistleblowing. Um, and so they can use that to their advantage if they have compliance announcements or if they have a compliance week uh, strategy, they'll leverage WeChat for communications, they'll leverage WeChat for applying different types of policy rollouts and communications. And so while WeChat sometimes is a, is a headache for managers and leadership because it is kind of how business gets done and in many cases unethically, uh, it's, it's hard to see, there are positive spins that you can put into it. Going back to the adage of turning the lemon into lemonade, you've got to think about how to make it more of a make compliance friendly, make compliance something that uh, employees feel that they have an ownership and a part in an investment, a stake in the game. Give them that sense of ownership within the compliance. And what that means is put it down to the level of through WeChat. That's something that everyone can connect to and work with. And so I think, you know, turn that into a positive and make sure that you uh, make compliance fun, as, as hard as that is to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, that concludes. I appreciate it. a lot of people staying on. Um, that concludes the questions we've gotten in. I know we're about 15 minutes over, but we wanted to get to as many questions as we possibly could. Uh, I would like to thank um, Warren Clark, and I would like to thank uh, Tim Fadi and Dan McLeod and Lee Xiao for participating in this event. Um, for your purposes here, we will um, recording the webinar, we'll be sending that out to people as well as the presentation. Um, and then you'll have the emails and such emails um, to uh, contact people after the webinar. Uh, but uh, so this concludes the event. Thank you all very much for participating and we look forward to seeing you on the next Grant Thornton East West presentation. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um.